Savior has. But Matthew chapter 19, John chapter 19, John chapter 19. Did I say John 19? Okay, then we're all on the same page at this point. John 19, 23 and 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for, for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, say, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Tonight I like to preach on this thought. Was it worth the gamble? Was it worth the gamble? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high, that there's none like you, Lord. I pray even right now, Lord, that you touch my mind and touch my lips, that your words may flow forth. Touch our hearts and our minds as well, that we may receive it, Lord, with gladness, that, we would, that it would fall on good soil, that we would remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would fall in good soil of the heart that we may remember it throughout our life and that it will take fruit, that we be even farther transformed into your very image. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. As we look at the scene right here, we know exactly what's going on. We've just discussed this in the last couple of weeks. Jesus Christ was taken to be crucified. And as he's hanging there on the cross, his garments are at the base of it. And the soldiers are trying to figure out who shall get what. I want this piece and I want that piece. For the soldiers to gamble to get the pieces of the clothing and the, and the um, remnants or the, the pieces of clothing or possessions of the people being crucified, that was not uncommon for them to gamble who might get what. And we find that as they were taking the raiment there, that they divided it along the sea, and they gambled huh, and divided it amongst themselves. But when it came to the coat, the coat was seamless. It was one piece of fabric. It was similar to that of the high priest that he would wear. There was no seam on it. There was no nice way to cut it. If he tried to cut it, it would tear and rip, and it wouldn't be even in any way. So they said, you know what? How can we... Um, Give, divide this among ourselves. It's such a costly garment. So they decided, you know what? We're going to gamble. We're going to cash law. And whoever the winner is, they shall get it. If we look at the gambling here and what it might have been, perhaps they might have taken some stones or pieces of wood and tossed them in a can or a jar and shook it up and whoever's piece came out or got picked, that might have been the soldier who won the garment. They might have been pieces of wood that were marked and with each individual mark. Maybe that would have been wood or stones with water in the pit jar. But most commentators agree that more than likely they gambled with dice here at the cross. Where they came up with that, I don't know. But all I know is what the scripture states, and that is that the soldiers determined that his coat was so too precious to rip and divide amongst themselves, so they were going to gamble for it. We cannot divide and spoil such a costly garment. If we were to go back and talk to the soldiers then and say, what are you doing? They tell us exactly what they were doing. You see this fine piece of linen, this fine piece of garment, it's too precious to tear around, so we're going to gamble for it. The winner shall take it, and they shall keep it. But if we would talk to those soldiers today and ask them, was it worth the gamble? Was it worth the winner taking that garment? Was it worth what you guys did? They might come back, and maybe from hell they would say, you know what? We had this garment in our hands. It had the precious blood of the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundations of the world. But we didn't know what we had in our hands, and we gambled for this bloody garment. You know what? Looking back, we might have got the blood of Jesus Christ on our hands. We might have taken that fine piece of linen into our possession, but we gambled for it. But I'll tell you what, that gamble was nothing near. The gamble we did with our own souls, and it was not worth the price. That fine linen garment, if only we would have recognized who he was as that sign above his head said in Latin, Greek, and Aramaic, they truly he was the king of the Jews. Truly he was the son of God. As others mocked him, as those Pharisees mocked him and said, If thou be the son of God, come down from the tree. If I would have known better, I would not have gambled with 
with this garment that day, but I rather I would have said, Jesus Christ and Nazareth, Nazareth, have pity on me. Your blood is down here on this garment, which I want, but I want, but I don't need the blood on this garment, but I need you to take, you to take that precious blood and apply it to my life. If only I knew what I was gambling for that day, for I may have won that fine, precious garment, but I lost and gambled with my soul, and now it is eternity in hell because I had knew not what I had. I gambled and I lost. If we were to look a little bit farther, there was one more soldier that day that was standing there at the foot of the cross. He stood guard. But as the sky darkened and everything else was going on, when he realized that Jesus Christ had died, if we were to take, ask him what his gamble was like that day, he might have said that it was a little bit different. Maybe we would not find him in hell, but rather maybe he would be rejoicing in heaven because we find the word of the central centurion that stood guard that day in Matthew 27 and the verse 4, 54. When the centurion that day and they that were there were with him. Watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Maybe if we could not talk to that centurion tonight, he might say, You know what? I watched as they gambled for the garment of Jesus Christ. I watched as the winner there had that bloody fine linen in his hand. But there was something else I took notice to that day, that I was a sinner far from God. And I, I was gambling with my soul every single day because you realize I didn't know who he was that day up until the moment of the earthquake and the sky turned black. And we hear in the words, Eli, Eli, Shabbat, not by God, why the has thou forsaken me? It wasn't until I heard it is finished and I watched as that man. That Son of God died on that tree. It was then I realized He was the Son of God. And every day that I was living before that, I was taking my own life in my own hands. And I was going to an sinner's house. But on that day, I changed and I said, I'm not going to gamble anymore. Jesus, I need you to save my soul. Oh, at that, on that day, I chose not to gamble with my soul. And I'll tell you what, it paid off in eternity. If we were to go a little bit farther and ask Jesus Christ himself, Jesus Christ and Nazareth, you were the Son of God and you are the Son of God, but you left the throne room of heaven, that place that God has to humble himself to dwell in, and you came down to earth. Why would you do such a thing? He would respond as he did in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. The whole reason he came to earth was for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ and Nazareth, you took a gamble leaving heaven and you came down to die on the cross. How, would you say that it was worth it? And I'm sure he would come back. I would do it all over again. I would die on that tree if it just meant one person came. Because for me, it's not a gamble. I gave my life that so you could spend eternity with me. He came to give eternal life. The Bible says, John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief cometh not to steal, but to, ki but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come to give life that you might have it more abundantly. The whole reason that Jesus Christ endured the cross was for you and I. Hebrews chapter 12 verses Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 states, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same shame, and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ, why did you come to earth? Well, I came to seek that and say that I was lost. Why did you endure the cross? Because the joy that was set before me. Because of the cross that was set before me. Why did you endure the gamble? Because to me, it wasn't a gamble. As long as one person came to me and asked for forgiveness. As long as one person could come and spend eternity with me. It was worth it. For the joy that was set before me. He would say it wasn't a gamble. But I was willing to give my life. 
if we would go a little bit farther and ask the saints, Peter, this man that denied Christ three different times, Peter, was it worth the gamble? Was it worth following Jesus Christ? If we would follow his life, Peter had a shaky right uh, life would walk with God. He knew exactly who Jesus Christ was, but everything was, when time went south, everything changed for Peter. And we find in Scripture that Jesus comes to him after he's risen from the dead. And where's Peter? He's all practically given up. He went back to his old lifestyle. He was there and he was fishing. And when he comes back from fishing, we are instructed that there is a fire waiting for him. And Jesus is waiting for him. And he says, Peter, will you feed my lambs? Peter said, yes, I will feed your lambs. A second time, Peter, will you feed my sheep? Peter goes, yes, I will feed your sheep. Three times Jesus asked him this question. Why? Because there's a little bit more going on here. Jesus saying, Peter, are you willing to follow me? Because as we look at the Greek word for that fire, it's only used one other time in Scripture. And that's when Peter denied Jesus Christ. So it's almost as if the whole time that Jesus is talking to Peter, it's going, Peter, will you take a chance on me? Will you follow me once again? Will you give your whole life over to me? Peter says, yes, Jesus, I will. And we almost get that whole connotation that while Peter is there getting whipped with those coals, it's like, Peter, do you remember when you denied me? Are you sure you're going to follow me? Yes, I will follow you. The whole time Peter is taking in that spell. Peter, you remember that damsel? And the whole time, that whole scenario is probably rolling through Peter's mind. I betrayed him. I betrayed him. I betrayed him. But here is the Son of God saying one more time, Peter, will you follow me? Peter, will you take a chance on me one more time? Peter, am I worth the gamble? Am I worth you giving your whole life to me? If we could ask Peter today, Peter, was it worth the gamble? Peter might say, well, if you would have been sitting there around that fire after I came back from fishing, I might have told you I'm not sure. I, it's a rough road. I don't know if I can handle it. There's a lot of people that came against us. There's a lot of people that were criticizing us. There was a lot of people that crucified the Son of God. But I'll tell you what. If you would ask me after my Acts 2 experience, I will tell you that there is nothing like it. And I'm never going back. If you would ask me after I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I would tell you that it is no longer a gamble, but I am not turning back. I'm only going forward. And you know what the end of my life was? The Holy Ghost delivered me from jail through the power of an angel. But I saw Jesus. And he said, Peter, you need to go back. You need to go back and die for my sake. Peter might say, if you would have had that happen to me any time other than that in my life, I would say, you know what? No, it's not worth my life. I, I can't do it. If you would have asked me before Acts 2, uh, there's no way, Jesus, I can go through with this. But I can tell you now, I gladly went back. The joy that set before Jesus Christ was the church of the cross. But the joy that was set before my cross because history records that Peter was crucified upside down. The joy that was set before me was now I was going to spend eternity with him. It's no longer a gamble, but I willingly laid down my life. It's not a gamble, but I chose Jesus Christ and to spend eternity with him. And I was willing to suffer for his sake. And we would go and talk to Paul. Paul wasn't worth it. Paul, you mighty persecutor of the Christians. You might say, you know, there was a time when I thought I was doing the right thing. I was zealous for my Jehovah. I was je 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 zealous for my Yahweh. 
And I thought I was doing the right thing. But there came a time when my eyes were opened. And I realized who Jesus was. You know, I saw Jesus die on that cross. I was part of that religious group that sent him there. I was part of those that maybe that mocked him. Jesus, thou son of David, if you are truly the son of God, call the angels. I would have been part of that group. But I didn't know who Jesus was until that day when my eyes were shut. And on that day when my eyes were physically shut, my spiritual eyes were wide open. And I realized who Jesus was. And when I realized who Jesus was, it wasn't a gamble. But I put full faith and trust in him. And from that day forward, things changed. And you know that my life was not easy. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9 verse 16, For I will show him, speaking of Paul, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul suffered many things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 27, we have a list. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundantly, in strife above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Of the Jews, five times have I received forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice was I did I suffer shipwreck. A night and the day have I been in the deep, and journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul oh, wasn't worth the gamble. Oh, there was no gamble to it. But gladly I followed Jesus Christ with my whole heart. Yes, I spent a night in the day in the deep. Yes, I was beaten by frogs. I was beaten by the Jews. My own countrymen turned against me. The heathen turned against me. But I'll tell you what. I wouldn't trade any of it for anything. It wasn't a gamble at all, Sister Peter. For I'll tell you one, the closer I got with God, the closer I got with him and knew who he was, it wasn't a gamble at all. But rather I was willing to follow him even unto death. For there was a day when I knew a man, whether it was in the body or out of it, I don't do know. But I tell you what, I was caught into the third heaven. And I saw lightnings, and I saw thunder, and I saw holy things that I can't even speak of. And I got to know God on a one-to-one -one per level. And it was not a game at all, but rather I would follow him wholeheartedly. And if I had to go back and do it all over again, the only thing I would have done was fall down at the cross there at his feet and say, Jesus, forgive me for I am a sinner. I would have forgot the blood, precious blood that was on that card. And I would have said, Jesus, you take that precious blood and apply it to my life. I want to be like this vagabond hanging on the street that say, Lord, I have done this and I have done that and I am not worthy but Lord, I am a sinner and make me clean and make me holy and make me one of yours because all I want to do is have you remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And it is not a gamble at all. The only thing I wish I would have done was I would have found Jesus Christ and found him sinner. That I may have known him wholeheartedly. That I could have taken back all those things that I've done to the church. That I might not have been the one that caused the death of the first Christian martyr. That I may not have been in that group that had him crucified. But it wasn't a gamble. It was not a gamble. I have followed him wholeheartedly. We've looked at the soldiers. We've looked at the Savior. We've looked at the saints. But what about the sinners? What would they say? Was it worth the gamble? And Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, there was a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? 
None is good save one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto them, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. This is the rich young ruler. And if we could ask him today, he might be in the same boat as those soldiers we first talked to that gambled for the garment of Jesus Christ. If only I had not been caught up in the things of this world. If only I was able to follow Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. If only I was able to neglect the things of this world. I wouldn't be suffering in hell today. I gambled in this life. And I lost. I took my own soul into my own hands. And I lost it for eternity. And there is no turning back. What about the rich man in Luke chapter 16? We know the account of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a beggar by the name of Lazarus who, kept, who sat under the gate of the rich man day in and day out, just begging for scraps, begging for crumbs. And the rich man saw him there every day, but he did nothing. But there came a day when both passed into eternity. And Lazarus was in paradise. But the rich man was in hell. The rich man begged that Abraham would send somebody to go and tell his brothers and his family members. Tell them it wasn't worth the gamble. Tell them about Jesus Christ. And Abraham said, they have the law, they have Moses, and they have the prophets. Basically what he was saying, they have the Bible. They are gambling with their own lives. They are taking their own life into their own hand. And it's their decision. And that they choose not to follow Christ after they have all these things, then they would not believe it won't come back from the damn total. The rich man gambled with his own life, and he lost. Those soldiers had they gambled for the garments of Jesus Christ. Who knows what happened to him, but maybe today, if we were to find him. They would say, I gambled. I took my own life in my own hands, and I lost. What about the great evangelist, A. A. Allen? He came from a rock home, a drunkard's home, but yet he was one of the greatest healing revivalists of the 1950s and 60s. Had one of the largest tents. Had one of the largest followings. But you realize that if you Google how did A. a. Allen die, in great big bold letters on Google will come up alcoholism. This great man of God, regardless of what your take on his end of his life might be, even secular history reports that A. a. Allen died a drunkard. When he passed away, he found all kinds of alcohol containers in his room. There's an account where he was performing a camp meeting in one town, and he got pulled over by a cop. The reason? He was drunk. And he begged the cop not to let anybody else know, because if word got out, he would be ruined. I'll be out of your hair in just a few days. But regardless, that does not change where A. A. Allen is today. And if we were to ask A. A. Allen, was it worth the gamble? All these great healings that you saw, all these great signs that you saw performed by God throughout your ministry, was it worth the gamble? He might say, you know what? I had a good run, but it wasn't worth the gamble. I took my life into my own hands. I played with the devil, and I lost. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, is it worth the gamble tonight? 
Is it worth the gamble, gambling with your soul? I hope all of us tonight can say with clear conscience, it's not a gamble. I'm not gambling with my soul. My life is Jesus Christ. Whatever he bids me to do, that is what I'm willing to do. I am not bound by the things of this world, but I'm going forward with him. You know, the Bible is clear. We don't have to question our salvation. We can know that we know that we know. We don't have to go to a man once a week and say, Father, forgive me, I have sinned. If we mess up, we go to the Father, we ask forgiveness, we pick ourselves up, and we move on. We don't linger there. We don't let the things of this world so encumber us. Because if we go back to our own ways and we play with sin, it's only a matter of time before we become ensnared to that sin once again. When we do that, we are gambling with our life. We are taking it in our hands once again. But when we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and we turn from our wicked ways, we are taking our life are placing in his hands. When we have water baptism done, we are showing to the world that our life is not our own. We are dead to this world. And we are taking off a new life in Jesus Christ. Are you gambling with your life today? Because God is not coming back for just anybody. But the Bible instructs in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27, that he's looking for a church that he might present to, it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What kind of church is this? It is a church where the, those Christians have placed their lives in God's hands. It doesn't mean that we don't ever mess up. It means that when we do, we acknowledge it, ask for forgiveness, we pick ourselves up, and we move on. We don't live there. We don't say, well, the world's doing this, so it must be okay. Well, we're not following the world. Because the world's going to find that it wasn't worth the gamble. There will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, have I done this and have I not done that? And if we were to interview them afterwards, they would say, you know what? He said, depart from me, I never knew you. It wasn't worth the gamble. I know exactly why. I know what I did. I knew what I struggled with. And I knew what I chose to do, regardless of what I knew. I chose to do things in my own way. Yes, I may have allowed God to work through me, but my life was far from it. Where are you at tonight? Is it worth the gamble? Because for the Christian, it's not a gamble. For the truth of the matter is, our life's not over yet. And we still have something that we should all strive to be doing. And that is getting closer to God. Paul knew God in such a way that he was caught up to the third heaven. Enoch walked so closely with God that God said, you know what? I'm going to take him home. Elijah walked so closely with God that you know what God said? Well, I'm going to bring you home. There's a man that walked with Elijah. I said, Elijah, I've seen the God you serve. I'm not gambling with my life. I, my life is in God's hands, but you know what? I want to have a portion. I want to have more miracles in my life. I want to have more of God in my life. And then we were to interview Elisha when he passed. You know what? He might say, God promised me a double portion. And I didn't see twice as many healings, miracles, and so forth. But I'm with God now. I'm in the presence of God, and it doesn't matter. I didn't gamble with my life, and it doesn't matter. Perhaps while we were standing there, the Son of God was standing, Jesus Christ, and heaven would become silent, and all of a sudden, everyone would the earth. As a dead man gets tossed into Elijah's tomb, and out popped the last one, Elijah.
Elisha's double portion. Our lives are not our own. And for us as believers, it should be a gamble. Every day, am I going to do my serve my own will? Or am I going to do the will of the Father? And I'm going to live whatever way I want. That church down there is doing that, so it must be okay. Even if the Bible says it's not. Where is your life at today? Are you going to gamble with it? Are you going to say, you know what? This Christian walk that I'm in, it's not a gamble at all. But I am fully invested in Jesus Christ. My life is not my own. I've been bought with Christ. Do you want more of Jesus tonight? Do you want more of him tonight? Do you want more of an experience that you can say without a shadow of doubt when you get up from these altars? You know what? It's not quite the same as it was before. I'm farther and I'm stronger. I got more of him. It's not again. If that is your desire tonight, why don't you come and find your place in some places you want?